Welcome twos and threes, great to have you with us today and we have the immense privilege, always an immense privilege, uh, to meet today to interview uh, the wonderful, the esteemed, the, the powerful Mr. Mark Powell. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for this podcast, Mark. Thank you, it's good to be here. <laughs> Um, Mark is actually a number of different instances uh, we wanted to actually ask him on today, um, particularly with his experience in both the, the pastoral, the apologetic space, the um, education space. Um, he works currently uh, in a variety of capacities, and please clarify me if I get any of these wrong, Mark. Um, you are an adjunct professor at Kerry Baptist College, is that correct? Yep. And also at... Uh, oh, Professor sounds a bit grand. Lecture. Uh, <laughs> no, professor, big title. We were just joking beforehand with the halo around you. No, so let's let's glorify this. <laughs> um, we also, you have a role where you were the adjunct professor at Massey Business School and also at Auckland Business School. That's right. Did a couple of years at Massey and then a couple of years at Auckland. Hmm. And this is on the back of having done your master's in apologetics via Biola University. That's that's a dream of mine, by the way. I'd actually love to do a degree via Biola. That was a good experience, I take it. Yeah, very good. You actually could have applied for a scholarship with Thinking Matters. Uh, really? There's a full scholarship. There's a full scholarship. It's just been awarded to do mm. the MA in apologetics at Biola. Uh, there may be another one next year. So Thinking Matters oh. is a apologetics organization in New Zealand. Mm. So keep your eye out for that. It might be that again next year. I mean, I'd love the idea of actually, you know, if William Lane Craig was to come and do a lecture there or the likes of, you know, Preston Sprinkle, um, Sean McDowell, they they are at that college, aren't they? That would be great yeah, yeah. to do under. And JP Moreland as well. He's, yes. Uh, he's probably one of my favourites. Mm. Um, why was he your favourite, just out of interest? Oh, the approach he takes. Uh, he's a very humble guy. Um, mm. he's, uh, he's a very spiritual individual as well. Um, mm. No, he's, he's very honest about his own battles as well with things like depression. He's, he's very good. Mm -hmm. um, but alongside that, um, Mark, uh, he has this experience where he's uh, shifted into apologetics in his, uh, his life now and his season now, his vocation now. Um, but there has been a previous focus also uh, with business and uh, quite light, high levels of management. You were the former CEO of the Warehouse Group in New Zealand. Isn't that correct, Mark? That's correct. I mean, I, I'm still, you know, huge part of my time is still involved in business. Uh, mm. I'm a non-executive director in a number of organizations. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we obviously, uh, we were talking a little bit about this before the podcast. Uh, I've heard uh, nothing but warm associations with you. You uh, apparently um, became saved, got saved by Christ uh, via doing an alpha course in Whangaputoa Baptist Church in the Hibiscus Coast. Isn't that correct? That is correct. In 2003. Mm. It's the only um, church I've ever been in. I'm still there. So no one else will have me. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated in perhaps actually hearing because, uh, as we said before the podcast, you are not uh, Scottish, you are Welsh. <laughs> and just actually hearing a little bit about your journey, about actually uh, how you arrived in New Zealand, maybe a little bit about your family and who you are. But before I do any further on that, uh, I should allow time for us to hear our intro. So. Two or Three Gilded is a series of conversations with Christian brothers and sisters considering their efforts and contributions to the kingdom vocationally, their stories and testimony of God's sovereignty and grace, and an opportunity to tackle the relevant issues the church faces in the 21st century. In this, we seek to equip the saints by networking within the body starting the conversation around often taboo subjects and seeking to develop unity across Christian denominations and traditions by opening up uh, discussion on worthy and necessary topics. We want to help educate the wider body of Christ by asking experts and people of wisdom across multiple fields the hot button questions and sophisticated questions that we believe there are answers for in Christ Church but that there is not necessarily always access to. We want to further the growth of knowledge and wisdom in ourselves, to worship God with our minds and fellowship with all of you. 
as we collectively seek to discern what God glorifying discipleship looks like for us in our respective vocations and in our spheres of influence. It is our heart and hope that Christ himself would be in our midst as we converse about things we believe he himself is very interested in. Welcome to Zor Threes. Thank you for gathering with us. And so, uh, just as we were asking before, Mark, or just as we were saying before, um, you're taught, you have this experience in these variety of sectors um, to do with business and now with a particularly theology in that area of expertise. Um, you did the uh, master's, a teaching master's, or sorry, I should say, uh, a no thesis dissertation, a fully taught master's, which was via Biola University. But I was curious to know a little bit about the, uh, the person that is you that was at Whangaparoa Baptist back in 2003, um, the journey that led you to New Zealand. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that, friend. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm 60 now, so given a, a summary of the life can get a bit long so I'll try and keep it short though yeah I grew up in South Wales I didn't in the UK I didn't have any um, real faith context at all uh, growing up I was the youngest of five children um, but uh, I started you know started working originally in underground coal mining um, then uh, moved into retail when the industry sort of collapsed in the mid 80s uh, but uh, through various journeys, you know, worked hard, got promoted, uh, got some pretty senior roles in retail and in logistics. Um, a significant uh, uh, point for me was going to live in Canada for a couple of years. Uh, I was I was uh, responsible for the startup of Walmart's logistics when they entered Canada, uh, and that was the first time I'd lived really outside the UK, and that got me thinking about where would I want to live long term. My wife Maria. Um, uh, we'd had two children by then. We'd always decided we wanted to be settled uh, before the children started high school. So that first got me thinking about New Zealand. Um, and also my wife was been a significant uh, part of my faith journey in that my wife uh, had been a strong Christian uh, when she was growing up. And um, I drifted away when she went to university. But when the girls were young, she'd started going back to church with the girls. Uh, I went. To, I used to go to the gym, uh, go to church, and uh, as long as you didn't turn all weird, I was okay. But uh, yeah, we it sort of ended up we we were looking at where we would live. We didn't want to go back to Canada; uh, it was too cold. Uh, but we looked at Australia, New Zealand, and, and settled on New Zealand. So that we came here, and when we came here, my wife she'd been going to a Baptist church in the UK. Not, not particularly denominational. She'd grown up in a Pentecostal church, but we saw um, Pongborough Baptist Church there as we were driving past. Uh, we decided to settle up here on the coast. And uh, she, I think being in a new, new country, I was open to new things. And she, I went along with her. I'd never been really in a church other than for funerals or weddings in a more traditional Anglican context uh, or something like that. And then they were running an alpha course. And so I, I was open to doing that. You've, uh, you're on mute, uh, Jared. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Oh, Zoom calls, honestly. <laughs> it's been a while since I've done one with all the COVID technology teaching disruptions. Um, your wife and meeting her, had she previously come from a, a Christian background? Uh, had this been an instance where uh, she had an uh, influence on your interest or your intrigue with faith? Yeah, um, as, I, as I mentioned, she she grown up in a Christian context and started going to church with the kids. Um, she, me and my wife actually went to the same school. Uh, we didn't really know each other well in school. We knew all of each other. Um, and she was part of what I used to call the God Squad from a local Pentecostal church. Um, but we didn't really know each other. We met when I was about 26. She was uh, a couple of years younger. When she went to university, uh, she drifted away from her faith. And um not rejected just like a lot of young people do going off to university uh drifted uh, and with the children she'd started going back to church uh and you know and so when we'd moved here uh, you know i think new country 
I was sort of open. I'd never been an atheist as such. I'd always thought there was something there. Um, but I I didn't really know a lot about Christianity as such. Um, and so, yeah, I was open and going to the Alpha course. And also probably significant, significantly, I'd matured uh, when I, you know, I did a, a Master of Business Administration, which is a, a, a business degree. And as part of my dissertation uh, thesis there, uh, I'd wanted to do a, a, a dissertation based on my previous experiences. And the lecturer said, well, if you're going to do that, you've got to do a chapter on why that would be knowledge. Uh, and that had actually, you know, which I did um, in the area of what's called epistemology, which is really the study of how we know anything. Um, and that had started me thinking, I, mean, I was on my third degree by then. And I'd never even encountered the question of what is knowledge. And that started me thinking about, well, how do we know anything uh, as well? And I think that had prepared me in some ways for the question of how can we know whether God exists or not? And uh, you're doing the Alpha course, uh, like many people, it's a journey. It's it's a journey that takes you into encounter with God. Mm. And, uh, you yeah, know, that's what happened. Mm. It's it's interesting how your journey is. It seems to be an interesting blend of the rational, the intellectual encounter and engagement with God, but also the spiritual, the emotive, the romantic, you know, the uh, the aesthetic encounter with God, we could say, you know, like there's there's both kind of presented there, I would say. Um, well, both are unapologetic. I mean, you know, apologetics tends to get associated uh, with head, head stuff, cognitive stuff. It can be a lot of Christians, I think, find it quite intimidating. You know, that's you could argue the fault of some who've done apologetics. Uh, it has come across that way uh, as being clever, intimidating. In reality, yes, uh, our ability to reason, to understand why we believe, um, includes the application of uh, understanding science, history, logic, uh, but also, you know, personal experience, direct encounter, uh, beauty, art, music. Um, you know, goodness are all an apologetic. They all point to God, uh, and really, you could argue that other realms of of uh, knowledge, you know, for example, science, have nothing to say about the most important things that make us human uh, in, in the human condition. The mm. questions of your know, beauty, love, uh, you know, goodness. Science has nothing to say about that. Science is the study of the physical realm. Um, you know, matter and energy in space and time mm. uh, has absolutely nothing to say about the most important things that make us human, mm. and that is an apologetic. And indeed, you know, I would say the the greatest apologetic is uh, experience of the Spirit of God, the uh, Spirit of Jesus. Um, and you could argue there's no need for anything else. There is no need for apologetics. I, I'm I'm sympathetic to that in some ways, mm. other than that it, that um, people's faith can be um experience can sometimes be rationalized away mm. uh, and i think the the and when people are confronted with challenges to their faith mm. uh, such as you know well we're just evolved from matter and energy or that there is no you know the scripture is just made up or you know is there any historical evidence for jesus um it, you know they can chip away at people's faith and they they can weaken and undermine, you know, and they can say, well, did what I think happened really happen? Were those miracles I experienced real? Uh, you know, and so I think, though it's holistic, just like I think God is holistic, um, it, 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 apologetics is important uh, in uh, stopping those, you, you could say, lies, uh, you know, encountering them uh, as well, because all truth is God's truth. That's a well-known mm. saying. And we shouldn't be afraid mm. of any discoveries of history or science or mm. um, anything. Mm. Uh, and actually, the more I've looked at those areas, philosophy, history, science, and you know, put them together with my personal experience, my faith is strengthened. Uh, mm. yeah. No, I love that. I mean, yeah, it's a, I definitely love that Augustinian statement, or it's attributed to him, I suppose, you know, all truth being God's truth, like, um, or like, you know, I guess another rendition of that Philippians 4 verse 9, you know, 
uh, if something is honorable, praiseworthy, glorious, you know, think about such things and all such things to ultimately derive from God, right? You know, good and life all being derivative from God. Um, I'm reminded as well, like, you know, when William Lane Craig often debates, he often centers and comes back around, you know, establishes this case for here's six arguments for general theism, here's three arguments for Christian theism, and he often finishes with the subjective experience like, you encounter God through relationship in Christian theism, and that's where it's actually distinctive from other forms of theism. Um, yeah, love exactly what you're saying. Love, 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 because it definitely is a reconciliation of the two that we find in Christian theism. Um, I, I am. I want to tease, I guess, I suppose, a little bit about that context in Wales, because um, I obviously am ignorant. I'd love to be educated a little bit. I know a little bit about uh, Wales as a country in terms of the Welsh revivals and in, in terms of actually uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. My, I think I mentioned to you this prior to the podcast, um, how my own father heard a, a sermon in um, Westminster Chapel. Um, this was years and years ago. He was 38 years. Uh, he's now passed to be in glory and set 76, but he heard Martin, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was from Wales preach. Um, and Gavin and Stacey, obviously, is a point of reference for me. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested in, I guess, I suppose, that agnosticism that you were talking about. Was that common for a typical Welsh man, Welsh woman, that there's a general sense of because of the, the Welsh revivals, there's a deference or a, a nominal response to God um, that was common? Uh, is that uncommon? What can you tell me about that? Look, I mean, Wales is a... Uh... It's, it's a it's, it's different types of Wales. Um, you know, I'm from industrial South Wales. Mm. Um, you know, coal and steel. Um, you know, people say to me, "Oh, I've been to Wales, a beautiful country." Well, yeah, it depends which part you're in. There's a <laughs> massive, you know, massive steelworks on the doorstep of where I grew up, yeah. um, and there are beautiful parts. Mm. The, people bring up the Welsh revival. The Welsh revival was the early uh, 20th century. It's a long time ago now. Yes. Uh, yeah hundred years ago. Uh, Wales is a, um, I, sounds damning to say, but I, you could say it's a spiritual wasteland uh, in the industrial South Wales. Uh, it's um, Bridgend, which is a town near where I'm from, has you know, one of the highest suicide rates in Britain. Uh, most people um, engage in distraction activity, get drunk, uh, have sex, um, you know, play sport, whatever. But, you know, I, I say Christianity is a fringe um, involvement in, in in Wales now, unfortunately. Um, where the distinctive nuts in Wales, there is there still is that history of, you could say, a Welsh nonconformism, um, the chapel, um, you know, uh, nonconformism in terms of not conforming with the, with the Church of England. Uh, there's that history. It's still a thread that's there. I mean, some of the songs that might be sung would go back to there. Some some of the songs, such as Callan Lan, others are hymns. Um, but I think it's you know, industrial South Wales now is um, that is not a re re really common, uh, mm -hmm. and so most people uh, wouldn't have a, a faith context in their lives. Um, mm -hmm. No different to New Zealand uh, in that sense. Mm -hmm. And I, I suppose because you mentioned starting your, you know, your working life in the coal mines, uh, was part of that like shifting into retail in response to say Thatcherism and how there was the, you know, the closing down of coal mines around different parts of England. Am I reading that wrong? Or well, you're reading it through the lens that is commonly um, historically presented by a. Uh, I would say a biased media. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the the coal strike in the 1980s was a complex issue. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as simple as Thatcher uh, closing down the mines. Arthur Scargill, who was the leader of the miners' union, was a, a extreme communist mm -hmm. who was intent on bringing down the government, uh, whose argument was you should never be allowed to close a mine on economic grounds. I don't know what he'd make of it now with mines being closed for environmental reasons. Mm. Uh, but um, it was a more complex issue than is commonly presented. Mm. Um, you know, 
And so, but ultimately, yeah, the, the, I left the industry because the industry was going to die. Mm. Uh, it was economically unviable uh, in the UK and you know, underground, but my training but, uh, was, you could say in, in management and I, I could have stayed in mining if I'd have gone overseas, but uh, you know, I, I, I saw retail, uh, there was a, a job advertised for re- retail, retail store managers. They were looking to pe- take people from other industries on a fast track. Mm. Uh, and I and I went that route. Yeah. Mm, I love that. Um, I'm, I'm curious a little bit about like uh, as to your wife and what she does working wise um, uh, or say your children, like uh, are you able to tell us a, a little bit about them? Well, my, my wife um, is, is largely does voluntary work. Um, mm. The local church um and you know helping out our son-in-laws and the business they've started their uh, electrical services business based here on the hibiscus coast mm-hmm. called tahi electrical give them a, a, a quick plug there um <laughs> might see their vans around uh, they started up a couple of years ago um uh my my girls are both married now to the to the boys who started the electrical business got mm-hmm. two grandchildren now um congratulations a, a young girl who's uh, about you know i was going to say 15 months but she's heading towards 80 months now wow. and a young a boy a boy who's about two and a half so mm. that's great as well they both live you know one of my daughters lives up here on the peninsula in pampero the other lives uh, down in glenfield mm. yeah we're uh we have two girls ourselves my wife and i are uh, another on the way it's uh it's a pretty enjoyable part of life and it's also good being a grandparent this is what the in-laws tell us because you know we do all the tiring work and they get all the spoiling work right <laughs> exactly we fill them full of sugar and give them back exactly <laughs> <laughs> i think it's called uh, revenge yeah, uh, that's, not, that's not a very good christian concept is it <laughs> i think it's I'm like i want to go good <laughs> I think it's pay it forward, right? You know, like surely, you know, we you've had your time, now it's their time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think at this point I'd love to ask you uh, a little about your about your experience of being in the uh the business realm and given your expertise and given your consultancy and your advocacy. Um, see, my experiences, I, I first heard you speak a number of years ago at a Thinking Matters conference. This was on a a church in the North Shore, probably as far back as 2016. Um, and I was I was really, really just inspired by the things you said that night. The likes of uh, maybe more Christians, you know, you were speaking to a, a largely younger demographic, you're saying maybe more should Christians should, should consider vocations in business because business is a space for both evangelism and discipleship. Um, that the likes of the, the boardroom is like where there are increasingly these spaces where you can't talk about certain issues. You know, in a boardroom, they're talking about what people value. They're talking about actually what is um, what is true and what is right and what is wrong and actually having those evaluative discussions, discerning discussions, and that's the chance for actually the Christian worldview to shine through. I even, I, I think I had the opportunity to close out the night with the final question where I said, given some of the contextual issues of the 21st century, what does apologetics need to look like? Um, And you gave a response about saying, uh, perhaps Christians need to actually think less about operating from a stance of uh, we are the ones in power, but actually looking throughout the arc of the Christian meta-narrative often Christians were the marginalized, often Christians were the the least of these. And yet that was the way God seemed to operate. He actually, you know, first Corinthians, you know, the foolishness of the cross, you know, to shame the wise, to shame the powerful, that seems to be the way that God operates and how Jesus actually models cruciformity. Um, I'm just wondering, like, these are some of the things I remember and they really stuck with me. Um, Are these ideas you affirm? Are these ideas you would have developed Um, further that you've revised somewhat um, just weighing into this next conversation um, and specifically then talking to actually this business aspect Um, but thank you thank you for actually what you shared that night it's definitely impacted me and definitely stuck with me (laughs) yeah um, my views have probably um, not changed but uh, developed and and Mm -hmm. grown Um, yeah I I probably wouldn't use a word 
I probably wouldn't have used the words evangelism and discipleship in the context no. that they, 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 they're what I'd say are Christianese. Um, but I do think there's real strong points of resonance uh, in the business world. Um, you know, I think, yeah, ultimately, Christianity, you know, when I did Alpha back in 2003, uh, uh, you know, C.S. Lewis quote that um, is used, was, was used back then uh, by Nicky Gumbel, um, you, know, you know, that, and I can't, this is, this is a paraphrase of the quote, but, you know, if, if this is true, it's not trivial, you know. If it's not true, it's irrelevant. It's just a, it's just a social uh, game going on. Um, but if it's true, God really exists. If God was re revealed in Jesus, if God was Jesus was God on earth, and Scripture is God's revelation of His character and His will uh, and, and communication to us, and His and His story um, that we can be part of. Uh, this is not trivial. It's twenty four seven, wherever you are, and um, I do think uh, we, as Christians, uh, build this image of um, you know full time ministry, the church. Um, yeah, the, the, there's there's these things you know that you know, these are the professional Christians, and the rest of you um, are somehow not fully professional Christians well you know to me you serve where you are whatever you are uh, and business is a you know ultimately uh, you know if you take a, a secular vision of the great commandment is to be part of something bigger than yourselves that helps others flourish that is where human beings thrive most whether they're Christians or not is being part of something bigger than themselves that helps other, uh, help other, others flourish and I think business is that you know I do think business um, is uh, really important uh, in society um you know ultimately uh, money is not you know money uh, just like power uh, can corrupt but also money is required every charity wants money every church wants money um you know ultimately it can be used for evil or it can be used for good uh, and the creation of wealth uh, in a business context pays taxes uh, that ultimately is used hopefully for societal good a good proportion could be wasted uh, but some does get through to being used for societal good uh, if you detect a bit of cynicism there i'm sorry but you know uh, ultimately you know, business is critical uh, and business flourishing and it can be an amazing uh, context in which you know, there is creative it involves people it involves relating with others Oh, and, and that's a great context in which you can live out your faith. And as a Christian, you are a minority uh, and it is a secular context. So you have to be wise. I think our situation now is far more akin to the first 300 years of the church. Mm. Uh, we're not in power anymore as Christians. Mm. Uh, I think too many Christians are living in, living in fear and defensiveness. Um, because they've got used to being in, in, in positions of privilege and power. Mm. Uh, and I'll get over it. We're not that. And neither was Jesus. And Jesus uh, didn't come into Israel and say, right, let's kick out Ro the Romans and let's get in charge, etc. cetera. Um, he was very wise. He didn't fall into simple gotcha traps. You know, when, 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 when people try to trap him with, with questions, he generally replied with questions. And so for me, the business context is, is not is you, you can be somewhere as a Christian, you can live out your faith well, being part of uh, helping others flourish using your giftings, loving God by using your giftings to help others flourish, loving others. Uh, and you can do that wisely. And I think when I say wisely, it's it's not being the weird Christian who uses Christianese a language that no one else understands. And almost just looks like you're judging everyone else. Mm. Uh, but similarly, you know, so that, that I think is one extreme. The other extreme, though, is privatizing your faith and hiding it. And I don't think we need to do that either. Mm. I think we can be very natural about our faith. You know, ultimately, um, you know, we can, in, in terms of with sharing it by not hiding it. Mm. Uh, people sometimes will have questions. Often they don't. Um 
It's interesting. I, I find in New Zealand there's a far greater reticence to even discuss it than I see in Australia. I'm on the board of a number of Australian companies. Mm. When I've been interviewed in Australia uh, for board positions, on my CV is that I've got a degree in applied theology and I've got a master's in apologetics. They'll ask about it. Oh, that's interesting. What's that all about? In New Zealand, people just sort of almost don't want to go there. They, they sort of hmm. ask about it. And I, there's something interesting there. I think New Zealand is a very secular country, mm-hmm. even more so than Australia in that sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but the question you raised there, you know, ultimately business is grappling with ethics. What is the role of business in society? So it's questions of the good. And we've got a lot to offer in that space as Christians. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, if we really look at Jesus. Uh, and yeah, I mean, one board I'm on now where the chair did find it very interesting uh, that, that I studied theology and uh, the apologetics. And we are working through on a board there. It wouldn't be appropriate for me to say which board it is. Oh, but oh. the whole question of how do you reach ethical judgments and ethical decisions? And as one of the board directors, he's asked me to take that forward. We've got a board meeting and I've written a short paper on that. Um, you know, so, you know, and even as an adjunct professor at Auckland Business School, uh, the question, I'd often do sessions where with the with the master students or students, I do a little bit of a, a framing at the front and then open it for questions. The questions would usually be, how can I be successful, mm. you know, in a worldly sense? Mm. And also, how can I be ethical? How can business be ethical? Mm. And I, I would often say in those contexts, well, what do you mean by ethical? What, what do you mean? What do you think? Um ethics is you know and you've got to get this blank stare and they then say well be good to others respect us so no 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 no, i don't mean that i mean what are moral principles ethical principles Mm -hmm. are they real are they real entities that exist in reality or are they are they just conventions that society's made up and you sort of get them looking at you oh where's he going with this and say and i say look i'm a christian I believe moral principles are a non-physical reality grounded in God Mm -hmm. that we can find out about, you know, that some things are right or wrong, fair or unfair, just or unjust in all places at all times, Mm -hmm. even if the majority disagrees. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what you're left with are societal conventions where might makes right. Mm -hmm. And you can see that. That they never ever thought about well, we what are these moral ethical principles that everyone can get so heated about? Mm. That's unfair, that's unjust, you know. Um, and and yet they never thought about just what are they? What what makes something unfair and just mm. and unjust, or you know, etc. And, and you know, as Christians, I think we've got a lot to say into that. Mm. You know, if you get a lot of business people in a room and executive team and say, Well, what are our values? They will come up with Judeo- Judeo-Christian ethical principles, <laughs> um, uh, and so you know there's a point of resonance there of connection that we can wisely step into. I think, yeah. mm-hmm. as well as bringing ourselves and not hiding our faith, and hopefully, if we're a good representation, you know, uh, all all not on, imperfect, um, but that also then will play out. Mm-hmm. And then occasionally you'll get a person who say, well, what's all this Christian thing? And there was one guy, I remember at the warehouse, who walked into my office and said, hey, Mark, and it was interesting the way he phrased it. Hey, Mark, you, you seem like an intelligent person. How come you believe in God? <laughs> <laughs> if you think about the question, what he was really saying is, how could anyone who's got any half a brain believe in God? Uh, and I said, well, you want to talk about it? Happy to talk about it. Um, mm. And so he said he would. So we, we put aside a good hour and had a good chat. Mm. um but yeah it's i think it's a great environment business uh mm. just like the arts just like education just like teaching just mm. like politics we need christians there who can wisely go into those spaces Amen. Uh, with humility mm. uh and engage engage with the world for, mm. for the betterment of the world mm. i love that Not just be a sunday morning entertainment what was the definition you gave before that business exists for human flourishing, um, so, you know, a, a secular version of the uh, the great commandment would be being part of something bigger than yourself that helps others flourish. Well, and great. I think business is is something. Not always. This you know, mm. it can get corrupted. You know, it's a it's a bit like I think it was Winston Churchill who said that sort of democracy was the least worst system yeah. uh, of governing. 
Mm-hmm. And I'd say business is, you know, um, is, you know, it may not be perfect, but it's the least least worst we've got in a fallen world mm-hmm. uh, it, that helps human beings flourish. Um, mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, I love that. Um, there's a couple of things, a couple of directions I want to possibly go in. Let me gather my thoughts. I've been thinking as as you've been talking. So part of it is this idea of uh, it's interesting you mentioned power dynamics. Like you know, obviously we live in a culture very much currently that's uh, you know I agree with that statement. We often default to you know Foucault or Nietzschean way of ways of thinking where we say like you know might is right and power determines. It's very interesting that critical theory is so advanced and so popular, which is actually saying this idea that you know cultural agonomies are you know vying for power on actually controlling what people think and actually the most dominant, the most powerful ideology will win out, right? I think that's a very curious thing you're saying there. But I suppose also, um, so my father, um, Ashley Church, I don't know if that mean, means anything. Uh, he, when we talked to him uh, a couple of podcasts back about actually being a Christian in business in his role, um, he came back to a similar idea you said as well, because obviously having been in different management positions and actually having been uh, confronted with similar conversations around, you know, secularism and faith. And like, you know, he, he phrased it in terms of, it's interesting how he gets into these commentary roles and people think, oh, here's this, uh, here's this dinosaur, you know, <laughs> he holds these particular views. Or, you know, why does he hold these particular views? But I mean, we're intrigued. Let's ask him on. Let's say, get, it, get him to tease out their ideas. He comes back to a similar idea of this, that businesses and people are often similarly, funnily enough, advocating when they get down to the bare bones of it, Judeo-Christian values. Like they actually get to what is ethics and what is right that comes with similar space. Um, would it be fair to say, like you talked a little bit about something of your your passions and what you're challenging your students with. Is, is, this, a, is this a big part of your in teaching business and actually teaching not just Christians, but just general people, you know, whoever you educate to do business well, you've actually got to think you're about, about your epistemologies. You've actually got to think about actually about what your worldview is. Would I be fair in saying that? Oh, totally. Um, mm. Look, ultimately, everything is about epistemology. Mm. Uh, how do we, how do we, what underlines underpins our knowledge claims? Mm. You know, um, you know, how, how do we know anything? I mean, apologetics is essentially, it's not about somebody clever standing on a stage giving 10 reasons about why we can believe in God and why it's slam dunk, boom, must be right, and preaching to the choir and everyone's happy. Mm. Um, you know, it, really, apologetics is just, what do we believe and why do we believe it? Um, and in that, what's important also is what do we not hold on tightly to? What are we comfortable to be more tentative about and what are we also come to say that we don't know god mm. has revealed sufficient but not exhaustively no. we don't know everything uh, and you know i think we've got extremely good reasons for believing the essentials of the christian faith but sometimes we raise non-essentials up to be essentials mm. uh, and that's very dangerous because then people who are brought up to believe that those non-essentials are so important go off to university that brick gets knocked away and their whole faith crumbles. Mm. Um, but everything is epistemology. How do we know? Uh, and, and that's in all realms of life. How do we make knowledge claims? And are they supportable, you know, ultimately? And what are they supported by? So, yeah, for me, what, how, what, what do we believe? Why do we believe it is the essence of an apologetic conversation? What do you believe and why would you believe that? You know, to be honest, it applies in a boardroom. Why? Do, what do we believe and why do we believe it? And you want to reach informed positions. And I have a, uh, my epistemology is, a, you could say, a holistic epistemology. It's, um, I like William, uh, J. Warner Wallace used the phrase, a jury epistemology. Uh, and I, I like that. It's, it's a sense that we take science, we take history, we take apply log- applied logic, we take the human personal experience and collective experience, your cultural your cultural experience as well. And you, you take that together with scripture um, 
uh, and you you they're all evidences uh, uh, that you can apply to a topic you know topics such as where did humanity come from you know a question such as who was jesus uh, was jesus resurrected you know and you apply that evidence is those facts and we weigh them for the best explanation of those facts and that's what happens in a courtroom all the facts are taken and the, what is the best explanation now it doesn't have to be 100 percent certain there's very few things we can be 100 percent certain about um uh, but what is the best explanation the most powerful explanation uh, of all the facts uh and you know i i'm i strongly believe i mean looked at it that the, the most powerful explanation of the facts of all you know from science from history from the human experience from collective experience is what's revealed in scripture uh, and it's supported by those other sources of evidence so it is all epistemology um it underlies everything you know you mentioned you know critical theory there you know critical the critical theory a lot of christians get speak scared by it and it's all wrong no it's not all wrong it's got some truth in it yeah it's got a lot of truth in it but it's it's like so many uh sort of of of, of uh of lies you could say it overplays those truths you know um it, it it overplays them and takes them too far uh you know so it goes from well there is evidence that perspective is important that power corrupts and there's been certain power institutionalized overall to a point that you can't know any truth everything's relative and uh you know to extremes of that that you know it actually eats itself doesn't it because it starts by saying it's all about power and that power is wrong and replaces mm -hmm. it with another power that seeks to oppress and silence that's mm -hmm. what happens in socialism and communism doesn't mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. you know it starts mm -hmm. out with such a zealous belief in their own righteousness that sounds familiar sounds a bit like the pharisees <laughs> uh, and ends up uh, justifying the killing of 100 million people in the last century mm -hmm. you know and you mm -hmm. see this in the sort of extreme liberal wokeness at the moment mm. you know what starts out as claiming to be liberal and tolerant ends up silencing mm. you know mm. and i don't want to get too political but our prime minister goes to harvard recently gets lauded when she talks about kindness and empathy mm. and yet i didn't see a lot of kindness and empathy of people who disagreed with the vaccine mandate now i'm not a i i believe the vaccine were important and good yes. they did good controversial in some quarters <laughs> um but the, the the fact that mandates were unable to be debated, um, you know, we're excluding a whole section of society, fight a minority. Yes. Uh, you know, the way that was handled was mm. it was interesting. Yeah. You know? mm. And so you know, it, it's the overplaying, isn't it? And and mm. when people, and this is the danger, I think, for Christians is when people think they're justified because they're so right and what they are doing is so good. Mm. That can often be used to justify terrible things as human mm -hmm, beings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and so yeah, it, it's it's how things can we've got to come back to the question of knowledge and epistemology. It underlines everything. What is the nature of reality? How can we know it? Mm -hmm. How do we interpret that? And then when do we, I use a phrase 10 out of tens? When we can reach a reasonable high degree of certainty, they're the 10 out of tens. It's like interpreting scripture. There's yeah. 10 out of 10s that you can say, hey, script is pretty clear on this. And there's things that are more 6 out of 10, 7 out of 10s. Well, there can be a bit of breadth here. There can be a range of views, maybe, mm. um, you know, in how we may interpret mm. uh, the evidence. And then there's speculation. There's things that are hinted at. You know, mm. um, you know I'm, I think it's pretty clear that there is an eternal separation from God mm. as a destiny. Mm. On eternal destiny with God. What that eternal separation looks like, the Christian word hell, I'm not so sure. Mm. I, you know, is it literal mm. as described in scripture? Is that metaphoric? Um, not sure. Mm. You know? Um, so let's be a little bit tentative on that. Yes. Um, you know, what is eternity really like? You know, uh, you know what are end times really gonna be like? Mm. You know, I think this we can overreach. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's where you come back to that thing. Well, we don't disappear into a sea of uncertainty because of that. Yes. There are things scripture is really clear on. Yeah, and interesting. Like they, they tend to be the clear essentials of the faith that all, have always been agreed. Um, yeah, like, I mean, but there's many other things that aren't as clear. So, like the likes of um, 
Leslie Newbigin wrote a book called Proper Confidence. Um, so it's kind of this idea the Christian disciple discerningly uh, uses both sufficient revelation, uh, general revelation, you know, special revelation, not exhaustive revelation, to inform actually, oh, you know what, that's a little bit of the truth, but no, that's overplayed, and like, that's actually right, and we can find unity in the diversity of belief in that space, like, I think that's really important for the Christian disciple in the world, right, where's the unity and diversity, like, where can we find the points that we actually have commonality and agreement, right? Um, yeah, it's, it really saddens me when Christians mm. um, fall out aggressively mm. over things I would consider to be of the second order. You know, mm. the classic area might be, let's take, um, where did we come from? <clears throat> the question of evolution yes. uh, versus, uh, you could say, creation. Uh, you know, for me, a 10 out of 10 is the evidence from science and many other sources, philosophy, for cause and design, for a causal mind and designing mind that is effectively God, yes. uh, all powerful, all knowing, all, all good. Um, the evidence of the, the, from science is of the start of the universe. The you know the evidence in the fine tuning of the universe. The evidence in specified complexity that we see in DNA. Uh, you know th this all is incredibly powerful evidence to point to a creator. But how that played out was it in six days? um was it over 15 billion years hmm. uh, various interventions hmm. uh to what degree could there have been some evolutionary forces at play i think that's a second order question hmm. um and it's 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 tragic when you see christians on that second order getting incredibly you could say hateful i've seen some debates on video that are, are hateful the hmm. key thing is, is there's this clear evidence for cause and design pointing to god and an inference a god inference in there um you know i have a, i land in a position on the second order mm. but i hold it more tentatively you know mm. uh, you know i have i'm troubled uh by some extremes but i, I i'm prepared to be wrong um yeah. you know i think some theistic evolutionists i find them hard to differentiate from a straight darwinian um pure naturalist yes. um but yeah, that's what. You know, how the degree to which God uh, may there may have been evolutionary mechanisms at play. Uh, I'm 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 more tentative on, on that. Mm. Um, you know, well, but when I, I come I, back to my my key source mm. you know, of, of knowledge, scripture, mm. you know, I hold tightly to cause and design. I hold tightly actually to um, you know the reality of an Adam and Eve. Mm. Um, mm. You know, uh, and. and you know, so you hold all that and you come to what do you hold tightly the 10 or the 10s and be comfortable with to say hey i'm not as clear on that and speculative theology can be fun but it can also be dangerous yeah true <laughs> especially if you especially if you take that speculation to a level of a 10 or a 10 <laughs> mm, that's a good that's a good insight um because yeah, I, I suppose with the there was something you were saying before i just wanted to try and catch the the grain of it now, I can't remember my exact link, but the question that I wanted to ask you there is obviously you have these different ideologies at play, um, and especially in the business world, you know, Christian, secular, you know, different worldviews at play. Um, I suppose then if it boils down to the definition you gave before, serving a cause bigger than yourself um, that supports human flourishing, uh, then the outworking, the orthopraxis of business, the the what actually we get to the, the the outworking of that being is competing definitions of what is human flourishing, I suppose, yeah. right? Like yeah. a business is actually seeking to say, how do we actually support human flourishing and actually what is our product? What is our service? Would that be fair? Yeah, I think that's it's partly uh, it, it is a part of service, but it's beyond that, isn't it? It is a wider contribution to society, mm -hmm. uh, as business, um, mm -hmm. yeah, as well. Employment, uh, how you treat people, how you treat customers, mm -hmm. how you treat suppliers, um, you know, the whole value chain going back mm -hmm. uh, in the countries. It is a broader sense than just that. Uh, you know, how you pay your taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's a, there's a much broader sense of how business contributes as well. Because mm. well, I'm curious then, like, 
I mean, when I when we talked to my father about uh, this particular idea of like Christians and business, the thing I'm still wrestling with, and I think we'll continue to wrestle with, but I want to take the opportunity to see as I have an expert who's in that world, is that, I mean, just thinking about actually re really in which we day we do business in Christian ways, like what does that look like? Because I think the first layer is actually thinking I am a Christian and I behave well, I, I witness to Christ well. But I think the, the layer deeper beyond that is actually, are there deeply Christian ways that inform the ways we practice business? Because I think that's actually thinking more deeply, like thinking about things like, what does it mean to be a kingdom professional? Or, you know, uh, uh, capitalism and actually thinking cruciformity, are those diametrically opposed? You know, like, uh, do, we, do we actually think about actually the way the free market system operates? Is okay. that is that good you know does it actually lead to good it's probably like you're saying like if it's the sole ideology it overplays uh its hand and that there is like you know truths that are overemphasized and lies that are you know the outworking of them is problematic jesus himself said you shall know them by their fruits right i wonder if that's often the way we actually do discern where some of these ideas lead but i, I suppose what i'm wanting to ask you there is you know, in terms of actually the deeper level of how actually we do business, how we think business, because they're cyclic, right? What we do informs how we think and how we think informs what we do. I suppose I'm asking, like, does it look like more Christians need to be involved in NGOs or social business? Does equity or equality, you know, excellence, does this actually need to inform? You've, you have spoken uh, in detail and with clarity on the subject of ethics and morality in business. Um, but I also think that there's this dichotomy sometimes um, in how Christians in the world do worship in terms of, you know, vocational ministry, right? Like, and your vocation could be your career, whatever it is, whether, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Um, sometimes we actually say, yeah, I'm a Christian on a Sunday, but that it has no observable or discernible difference in the way that actually I do business or think business. I, I'd love for you to just give me a little bit of insight, if you don't mind. There's a lot of different questions you've, you've Yeah, I know. Up. Sorry. Long monologue. Yeah. <laughs> Forgive me. Yeah. The first thing, let's talk about capitalism. Yes. You know, um, you know Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, uh, you know, goes back and often quote his underlying capitalism. That was written as a moral philosophy. Mm. I'm not a capitalist on a shallow level. I am a capitalist. Mm. I'll shock people. I'm, I'm a caring capitalist, and true yes. capitalism should be caring. Mm. Uh, capitalism is a system of free markets. Um, that free markets relies on competition as a key check and balance for power. Mm. Um, and also relies on um, certain basic. Uh, standards uh, of government of government uh, to regulate uh, markets uh, you know to ensure fair competitive playing fields uh, overall uh, that relies I think on uh, government uh, to provide good um, minimums of labor standards and, and, and ethical things so, so it doesn't exist in a in a vacuum uh, overall um, you know so the caricature of raw wild capitalism with no bounds, yeah, that, that's not what I see as capitalism. Um, that, that's a distortion. You right. know, a, a free markets that that um, are consumer led, uh, where there's consumer choices, reasonably regulated. Uh, I think, I, and ashamedly, will say, is a system that allows huge creativity and creates a huge amount of good. Yes. Now within that system is people. Yes. And people with a Christian anthropology are fallen, have a curved mm -hmm. tendency to selfishness. Mm -hmm. um, and so what the beauty, I think, you know, of a least worst system in this fallen world, I'll use that thing, is the, the market system with a check and balance of comp competition that will balance power and that corruption mm -hmm. becomes. Where markets, when markets fail, and I think we do have examples of market failure 
in our in our modern society in the areas of technology, big technology, banks. New Zealand's got a big problem with lack of competition in, in a number of sectors. Um, that's where you can get abuse of power. Mm. Um, and it's not genuinely consumer led. Yes. You know, because you know, and, and so you, you there's a number of levers there that can help capitalism work better for the common good. Yes. And some of those get out of kilter at times, and where they do, they need adjusting. We need we need to do something about big tech, Google, mm. Facebook, mm. Uh, etc. Um, that happened in the 1930s when they broke up big oil. You know, it's mm. a constant tension you know, overall. Well, but see, the wonderful that, thing, let me just just yeah, finish. Sorry, the wonderful thing is by being consumer led, is there's mm. consumer pressure. Mm. And I hear ethics talked about in the boardroom far more than most other contexts, because mm. the, the the phrase "social license to operate" mm. is largely because we are consumer-led, market-led, you know. And so power balances because of consumers, power balances because of competition, all help in that system. You know, I think our younger generation, because they've started to forget the history of 30, 40 years ago, gets drawn to this idealistic view of socialism. Mm. Um, where we're all going to be equal and it's all going to be nice. Mm. Okay. Where's the check and balance on power? Because there's always people in charge. Don't kid yourself. There's always mm. people in charge. So where's the check and balance on power in that system? And unfortunately in that system, uh, too often and history has shown we end up with people at the top who are self-interested, hey, all human beings again, but there's no check and balance there. Mm. It is pure power. And worse than that, they often are so convinced of their self-righteous rightness that they end up justifying the most extreme things. You know, history is really important. Mm. And so uh, you, know, I, I'm a caring capitalist. Um, I think most are. Uh, there are abuses, uh, there is greed, uh, the checks and balances are needed, mm. the most important of which I would say is is, is competition. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a big picture thing. And then you started asking about, well, when you're in that system, individuals make a difference. So when, yes. when you have influence and there are things being discussed, debated, you can, you can play into that. A question mm. I often ask in the boardroom is, well, what's the truth? Mm. <laughs> You know, you get, say, you get some sort of crisis for a company and PR people want to, you know, say something or, you know, my view is where you start with the truth, start with the truth. And if you've messed up, admit it. Mm. Um, you, you can change a whole conversation and in a leadership team or a board table just with one question. Mm. Yeah. And so um, there is no perfect system in this world because mm. we're in a fallen world. Sure. Um, reasonably well-regulated, market-led capitalism, I think, has proven itself to have lived to have hugely beneficial to society. Mm. It needs checks and balances. It needs checks and balances in regulation from consumers and with competition. Mm. Uh, I'm concerned that the pendulum will go so far the other way. Yes. Uh, and people will fall again in love with government central power. And then I ask, where are the checks and balances? Mm. No, I, I think that's important because it's, I think of something like in Deuteronomical law, you know, something like a practice of a year of Jubilee, right, is supposed to actually deal with the problem of the centralization of wealth, right, properly practiced. You know, you actually have a redistribution of wealth every 50 years if Israel was to practice that as a principle, as I see it, as I understand it. And so those checks and balances may serve as some kind of actual um, process of doing that. I suppose what we see is a problem with like, you know, socialism becoming a, a, a pop ideology, right? And it informs culture and it informs the way people do business. You, see, you wonder if actually there's this idea of, I mean, I was thinking about it recently with like the likes of, we have a duopoly with supermarkets in New Zealand, you know? It's progressive limited or it's a uh, pack and save, you know, like in, in New World. Um, and how the price freeze that was offered by Countdown recently, the way like you get into the details of actually what is actually being presented and what is being offered, it's it looks good, 
it's not actually meaningful in actually helping people who are you know fighting the inflation uh budgets that we all have to contend with right and it's it, this is one such example of actually without regulation without checking and when we have just kind of the centralization of wealth that happens over time it's problematic right so i don't necessarily have an answer <laughs> like competition should exist well, that, that's, the, that's the issue isn't it you know we have to grapple with imperfection mm. we have to grapple with an imperfect world mm. and you know look it is a lovely idea it's communism socialism we'll mm. all be equal we'll all get paid the same we'll all share everything and, and hey i'm sitting here as a christian saying that i don't think that's realizable in a fallen world mm. why not because if somebody's working harder than the other person starts looking at and saying, well, why am I working hard now? You know, my boy, my wife worked on a kibbutz, which tried to try to live out that system. Mm. People just became dis, de demotivated. Yes. You know, there's always someone in charge. There's mm. always power. You know, so what's, who, what holds them accountable ultimately yes. in the in our system? Yes. You know, what's the motivation? Where, where, where do we um it, it, it's 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 you know it might sound defeatist but it's too idealistic in my mm -hmm. in, i would say um it, it, ultimately human beings in their fallen state are, are incapable and we all think the problem isn't us but the problem is me the problem is you Amen. and the problem is the people listening Amen. we the wonderful thing about christianity is we admit that yes and the first, it's like an alcoholic. If they don't admit they're an alcoholic, they're never going to solve it. So at least by admitting it, we can question ourselves. We can mm. say, we can challenge our own thinking mm. and say, well, am I being greedy? Am I being selfish, et cetera? Mm. And, and so Christians in, in those contexts can be really helpful. Mm. Uh, you know, and so, but, but, but back to your, um, you know, is an, is like the last question there's a number of questions in there yeah, you know, <laughs> when, you, when you you take something as simple as the food market in new zealand yeah. two players is yeah. not enough right. so you can look at it, what what woolworths have done uh, sorry uh, countdown which is woolworths um but they're basically competing and they've done a bit there to try and show they can about price they've probably given away some margin to do that but we, they need there needs to be more fundamental competition mm. you know if Aldi came in tomorrow, they would all find a way of dropping their prices. It's not because they're actually, people think they're all sitting there as if they're sitting in a room thinking, oh, how can we, you know, how can we do things that are almost unethical? They're not, they're not doing that. There's ju they're just not challenging themselves enough in the sense of, well, they'll, they'll be wasted time and activity and stuff that's passed on to the consumer that they're not challenging because there's not the heat and pressure of competition to have to challenge it, yeah. you know. And as human beings, we seem to need that moat, that push. We descend mm -hmm. into a, a lazy steady score if that pushes. And then the market gives that push, you mm -hmm. know, when you've got competition, you mm -hmm. know. They're, mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're not, you know, I know the CEO of Foodstuffs, he's a good guy. You know, he's not someone who's sitting there saying, oh, let's see how we can screw people. But I do know that if Aldi came in, they suddenly would have to reassess what they're doing and they would find ways of being better, faster and cheaper for, you know, because, because of, because of that competition. Yeah. Mm, I like that. Uh, yeah, I well, the Christian anthropology is critical here. Mm. You know, we are curved away to, to from God to ourselves. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, yeah, I mean, that's very salient in of itself. <laughs> um, I, I would love to actually uh, shift gears a little bit. I want to ask you a little bit. We have talked about it in some depth as well, but there are a few questions before we look to close out that I wanted to ask you about apologetics specifically, if you don't mind, good sir. Sorry, I, I'm not being provocative here, but I, I, you know, good. Because I want to be a little bit provocative because I think there's a lot of naivety. You mentioned, uh -huh. oh, Christians go work for NGOs and all the rest. Where do the NGOs get their money from? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, seriously, yeah. where do they get money from? Mm -hmm. you know? Or the, you know, some, they might get it from the government. Where does the government get its money from? Or the money tree, is it? Yeah. Mm. Um, and then, you know, 
a lot of their money will come from charitable giving. Mm. Church, you know, churches, where do they get their money from? Well, charitable giving. So, so there's got to be wealth creation. That, that's what that's what I want to actually <laughs> ask you then. Like before I shift on to that next thing, that's actually a sorry. Really, no, it's good. It's a really vital point because I don't think God is against the creation of wealth, right? That doesn't seem a good exegesis on, say, the cultural mandate, right? Or actually, you know, what again, a definition of human flourishing, right? Like, therefore. I mean, Jesus himself said money is the root of all evil. He didn't say money is evil, right? You know, like... I, no, it's, I, it's the root of all kinds of evil. All kinds of evil, that's it. So and be, it is. Yes, and I'd be curious then actually saying like, okay, you've talked a little bit about that then. Like, where does, you know, where do these different places get their money? Obviously, Christians who were inspired to do what God has given them the gifting to do well, create wealth. That's a good thing. I mean, can you unpack that a little bit? Like, what's the checks and balances for the individual? So, so the check and balance on the individual is, what is money to you? Mm. How are you living your life? Mm. Oh, Christian disciplines of simplicity, mm. you know, of generosity, um, giving, um, not making money an idol for yourself. Um, you know, how do you live? Do you every is it a constant chase for more, more, more? These are ethical issues of the heart, of the yes. human heart, aren't they? Yes. Um, you know, uh, and you know, I, I'm not sitting here as a as a um, trying to present myself as a pillar of uh, virtue, um, but you know, I, I don't live down in Rimuera in a six million dollar house, driving the bit latest car, and want to dress the latest brands. You know, money is not my God. Um, similarly, you know, I don't want to live in absolute poverty um, either. And, and so there's an individual in there, you know, that how do you create your own discipline uh, you know, in that so that you're not, uh, you know, living. And to be honest, I think people can become slaves because they increase their standard of living all the time, the more they earn, and they end up being, becoming slaves to mammon, to money. Uh, so you've got to challenge yourself, isn't it? Your mm. money, power, position, status. Mm. Uh, what are you making a god of? Mm. Uh, and you know, not becoming trapped in that. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's the wonderful thing about being a Christian mm. in, in business is you are you're a little bit slightly dangerous as well. You are free. Because it's not the end of the world if you lose your job tomorrow. Mm. It's not the end of the world. You, know, you will take a stand on principle um, that something is just wrong, even though the consequence could be you, you lose your job. Mm. Yeah. But you can, so, so, yeah, it, it's and money, like power, position uh, is alluring. It is a danger. And one of the dangers in business is that one of the dangers for pastors in in church structures, especially where they're given too much power, is sex and power, mm. and we're seeing that all the time, aren't we? Mm. Um, overall, so every field has its dangers. Yes, it's allures. Yes, it's it's siren calls uh, mm. that you know can draw people. Even mm. poverty, you know, working in in poverty can become a pride. Mm. <laughs> you know, um, and, and and so you know, I, I work with the poorest people, and look, you know, there's a pride and identity that eventually can come through that. Mm. Yeah. You know? So so we're all susceptible to these pulls. The pull, it would be right to say the pulling, the danger in business is money. Yes. Yeah, and greed. Yes. And so you're, it's right to point that out. Mm. But we've also got to see that these these you know, dangers exist in different contexts in different mm. ways mm. I, I wonder if something of a working answer is you know people put the you know x2 example and the believers shared everything in common um <laughs> some people use that in advance as an example of socialism it's like oh socialism in the church and it's like but the difference is the difference is it's like for the individual 
that came from transformation within. Like these people had their individual motives. They desired to give of their wealth. They desired to share it out. And I think maybe that's the point of actually for the Christian where we see the hope of uh, kingdom now and kingdom not yet tension. There's individual Christians who feel motivated to worship in their vocations and their and whatever that looks like, whatever God's called them to do individually, right? It's actually saying, uh, if you make plenty, that you steward that wisely. If you uh, make plenty and you want to give it away as God calls, do that wisely. If you make little and you want to give it away, do that wisely. If you make little and you need to use that to uh, give to the things that actually God has called you to do, like your family, like your friends, like your loved ones, like do that wisely. I wonder if there's that kind of like both the, yep, there is a true in all circumstances, but also what is the Holy Spirit calling the individual to do? Um, if you, oh, can, yeah. if you yeah. compel, it's like socialism would compel, Look. whereas like transformation from within would say, no, what does the Spirit inform you to do? Look, I think we, you take that Acts 2 passage, hmm. um, or, or even the passage about, you know, a uh, rich man who's told to go and give away everything. They should make everyone uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But it would be poor exegesis to say that's what it's saying. Because hmm. you look at scripture in the round, and clearly there were people who gave generously, but they didn't give everything. No. Exactly. They had problems. They they supported. You know, I think we should all have a pebble in our shoe, to use a mm. Greg Kugel phrase. Mm. That are we being generous enough? Because mm. we are called to be generous, mm. without a doubt, mm. and we are called to give out of our blessing. We are blessed mm. to be a blessing. Mm. You know, we should wrestle with that, and in wrestle with that, um, give where the spirit calls us, and recognize our tendency to selfishness yes. overall. So, you know, I, I, it would be poor exegesis to say that Acts 2 supports socialism. I, mm -hmm. I could pick that I apart quite, quite extensively, agree. you know. Um, and, and, and all bad theology is based on one Bible verse, um, <laughs> taken out of context. Um, but I'll counter myself and say it should challenge everyone. Mm -hmm. Am I mm -hmm. being generous enough? Mm -hmm. You know, we are called to be generous without a doubt yeah so and, you know and so as a, as a person who is blessed in business i think you have to wrestle with that you know and and get you know it is actually really free and just to give stuff away mm -hmm. you know because you're constantly showing god that the money is not your idol mm -hmm. over, yeah um so yeah i think it's um we're called a generosity and in business you can have an opportunity to generate wealth that, that allows you to be generous, not for, not for your glory and not to show it about. And, you know, I, 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 I think, you know, there's a, there's the, the, I think there's a strong biblical emphasis on, a, on a anonymity, anonymity there, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and not, but, we, we should be challenged by that but what you you've got to be able to create the wealth to be to be able to challenge by it in the first place yeah mm. well i quite like you know the example of you know the reason i mentioned if you know the individual christ disciple is you know impelled by holy spirit to do this you know jesus himself gives the example of the widow giving the two small coins right you know it's in her poverty she gave all that she had you know because she felt so motivated to you know and i like what you're saying it's like we should feel challenged by that but then shouldn't develop a whole theology on one encounter either like you know we take all of yeah, um, to inform you know, sometimes when i've you know i've given something or whatever because oh, i was really generous oh, no, it's not. Mm. you know is it you know I, i'm challenged by that widow and the widow's might mm. you know, she gave out of her lack mm. um yeah, and and so I think yeah that we should be challenged. Um, the danger with just saying, well, as the spirit calls you, we, you, again, human beings, you can rationalize that. Well, I don't feel yeah. really called by that. Yeah, you that's know? good. Um, you know, I don't feel really called, so I won't. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we should err on the side of over generosity, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and. Um, 
yeah, it, it, but as I said, you've got to create the wealth before it can be shared. True that. True that. Yeah. <laughs> Part of what I I, I hopefully have been doing in this is, I think, too many Christians. Uh, well, there's two equal and opposite errors, isn't there? Uh, there's the theology why I'm blessed, um, and <laughs> keep it to yourself. Uh, then there's the theology. There is this cultural um, uh, theology creeping into the church. Uh, on the other hand, that is naively looking at business as if there's something wrong with it mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's not where proper christians should be as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm sort of put i'm pre i'm pushing some buttons hopefully on that uh, if that's where some people are, are leaning mm. well, I, I love what you said i like you know i'm loving what you're saying because it's definitely um, the vineyard, which I was members of their churches for a time, one of their principles they often have to advocate is the quest for the radical middle, right? So, so much of the Christian walk is like, you know, existing between that tension between two extremes, right? And actually trying to walk that fine line in between. Yeah. Um, but I, I do want to ask you a couple of questions before we close out, just around apologetics particularly. Um, I, I'd love to ask you uh, around this idea of doing your thesis which drew upon some of this, but also went in a slightly different direction. You know, what were the things that really stuck out to you, sung to you? Like, you know, what did you discover that really is now informing what you're doing now, having done that period of study? Would you be able to enlighten us a bit on that? Yeah, yeah. look, I, I teach apologetics at Cary uh, Baptist Theological College. Um, it's got the name Baptist in there, but it's it's many, many different denominations mm. um, that go there. Um, I teach apologetics. Uh, what I took from the study of Biola was, number one, and we talked about it, it's really all epistemology. You know, what do we know and why do we, why do we know it? What do we believe? Why do we believe it? Mm. Uh, knowledge claims. Um, that was the first thing. Um, and the second thing is, what was good at what I really enjoyed about Biola um, was a lot of the assignments were based around reading a non-Christian book, an atheist book, um, and critiquing it. Um, and you pick up, you know, something like Richard Dawkins, you know, the case for his case for evolution, uh, the greatest show on earth, or you pick up a, you know, I was going to say a radical liberal Christian, but I think to apply the word Christian to him is um, a distortion, just someone like John Shelby Spong, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, and you think, oh, well, am I going to read anything here that will undermine my faith, whatever, mm -hmm. and, and you you do a, a, a review, and you, tr you try to be a fair review, but you actually go, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. Um, Bart Ehrman, who's very successfully undermining the faith of a lot of Christians at the present time. Yes. You know, um, there's nothing there. And I don't mean that arrogantly. If you read the book, critique it, and you come at it with the right resources, you know, take a bar to him and uh, textual critic, he makes these wild claims of 500,000 errors in, 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 in scripture, etc., which really do undermine Christians. But if you really step back and, and look, critique that, look at what he's trying to say, you know, you're talking about, you know, 5,000 odd manuscripts, each manuscript with about you know, uh, th thousands and thousands of words, we can be pretty sure of 99.5% 90, of, of our current view of what the original autographs are is correct. He, he, he very skillfully, I think you could say mischievously, you could even say evilly, um, takes his basic thesis, picks up about three pieces in scripture that are disputable it's never been hidden any bible will say these you know these aren't in the earlier manuscripts the longer ending of mark um the woman caught in adultery and then connects that with these wild um statistics to make this claim that we can't tr trust anything in scripture mm. so so you know being able to read a book like that say well is there anything in this and then applying a critique to a critical view to that is is really powerful because uh, you can actually come back to that all truth is God's truth. It it instills that confidence, not arrogance, but confidence that God has revealed enough for us, sufficient for us, and it is true, and we can believe it. Uh, and you know that 
builds a real rock, um, which you know is is then most powerfully supplemented by encounter with the Spirit of God, um, uh, to to give a, a a faith which is actually a small step, not a big step. It's not a blind faith. It's a small step of trust uh, that that you can be feel very comfortable with and isn't that easily undermined. Uh, you've gone on mute again, Jared. My gosh, so bad. <laughs> um, so, and so you're saying there, I'm curious to link it to, uh, obviously you've done a number of uh, talks with Thinking Matters. They're an apologetics organization that operate out of New Zealand for listeners further afield than New Zealand. Um, and I'm uh, curious about some of the topics then that you're talking about. Um, a lot of them are kind of actually touching on things we've already discussed, right? This idea of reality and how we know it or wrestling with difficult issues or uh, postmodernism, relativism and its problems. Uh, I, I guess I'd be curious then to know, other than what you've already said, are there any particular reason you like to speak on these topics and why they're close to your heart? Is it kind of, a, again, a, an outworking of what you've studied at Viola and your, your testimony thus far? Um, I, I, I'm a generalist, even in business, I'm a generalist. Um, I, I take a big picture view. So I'm, I'm pretty comfortable speaking on most apologetic topics. Mm. Um, uh, the, the, the under, we talked about the underlying idea of what's, what's reality, how can we know it? And then applying that in different areas, I tend to come back to that big picture, yes. you know, rather than dive into the resurrection, drive into that. And I'm happy to talk on those topics, but what can we know? How do we know it apply to that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the questions, um, I tend to get more drawn at different times to different questions, actually. Um, for, for a while, I did a number of talks on why would, it, why would God allow evil? Um, yeah, I've done a number of talks on that. Specific. I've done talks on the resurrection. I've done talks on, um, on, you could say on creation evolution, but more from a point of view of the, of, of, of one step back again, the difference between science and scientism, mm -hmm. you know, philosophical naturalism, uh, which often stuff that's applied as being science, and you should believe science, isn't science. It, it's a philosophical position that assumes all that exists is matter and energy in space and time. And, and claim, you know, science is a great tool of finding out about physical matter, energy, and space and time, as we said right at the beginning. But it's got limits, and yeah. and it over and scientism is that overreaching, uh, which then says, you know, all that exists is matter, energy, and space and time. Well, no, science, science doesn't prove that at all. Mm. It's just that's the only it's the only to, it's the only thing it can work on. It's it's the tool that helps work on that, but it's got nothing to say about broader aspects. Right, as we said at the beginning, beauty, the soul, immaterial, non-physical realities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I, I can move to most a number of topics. Uh, I'm always coming back to, you know, that, that question of epistemology, probably mm -hmm. in a broad way. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but um, yeah, also different topics become more. Um, Relevant in different times because people, the culture is pushing questions in different directions. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And so then, like, uh, if you permit me, two more questions that I do want to ask you then is I, I mean, that question that I originally asked at that Thinking Matters conference uh, so long ago, I'd love to know again, like, maybe you revise that answer, but maybe hearing what your response to that would be for this audience. Um, given some of the issues that the church is facing in the 21st century, um, what do you think apologetics needs to look like? What do you think evangelism needs to look like? I think it's a conversation. You know, mm. what do you believe? Why do you believe it? Um, mm. It's a conversation we shouldn't feel defensive in. Uh, it's a conversation we shouldn't feel like we've got to have all the answers. Other people, you know, it's largely the conversation largely should be asking the other person well what do you believe why do you believe that you know um, what do you mean by x you know if somebody says well it's been proven the scripture was all made up later well, what do you mean by proven 
what do you mean by scripture? Why do you think that? Is it just a snippet you read in a magazine somewhere? That you phrase it that, that, that in that way, that's too mm. aggressive. But, mm. you know, a conversation could go on over two hours maybe. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a confidence to be able to engage in conversation without feeling defensive, without feeling attacked. Uh, not and without feeling you've got to have all the answers, and even in the conversation, being prepared to say, oh, "That's a good point. Um, never thought about that. Uh, I'll go away and have a think about that." <laughs> without your whole faith crumbling, you know, because um, we can't all be expert in everything. Um, yeah, it, so that's why I think apologetics is now. It's it's also got I think two purposes. Uh, I think it it's it's within the church, within the people of God. Uh, I think apologetics has got a role because people get attacked. You know, I mentioned Bardum and a short while ago. Mm. They, they read one book and then suddenly they're prepared to throw scripture away because they've read this one book. Um, I think there's other things going on, uh, you know, but uh, yeah. And, and so I think it's got a role within the church. And then it's got a role uh, within the people of God, but a role outside of the people of God uh, as well. So, yeah, but largely it should be a conversation around, well, what do you believe and why do you believe it? And Christians um, often don't know why they believe what they believe. They, and that makes them very vulnerable. Um, you know, they, because this comes back to one brick gets taken away and, and their whole edifice falls down. And that's, you know, we have this phrase deconstruction, uh, ex-evangelical, uh, the common phrase is coming out now. You know, it's tragic, isn't it? You know, and, and and the reasons these people give are so shallow, um, very often. Um, and often, you know, what's how Christians have behaved got to do with whether Jesus is true or not. You know, I could critique the church and critique Christians, you know. Um, yeah, so I think apologetics is about that. What do we mean by believe it within the church outside, but I also think the church is. Uh, going to undergo radical radical challenge we've come back after covid i think most churches have found a lot of people have drifted away um we're, we're a smaller minority than even we once were and adjusting to that and what does it mean to be the people of god now in this context it is going to be a challenge and i think part of that it, we do need to be confident in what we believe uh and you know, apologetics has got a key role in helping that mm. because people will be dispirited when they see less people yeah uh, and or people who leave or they have friends who uh, have drifted away uh who've been christians for a long time i was in a conversation with somebody yesterday a 60 odd year old christian you know two of his friends who've been lifelong christians seem to have just been drawn away you know uh either drawn away completely or drawn to some fairly um, very liberal interpretations you know, to a point where you just say it's a general universalism, uh, that there's something there, and et cetera. Mm. Yeah. Mm. No, that's, that's insightful. I think, like, definitely thinking about COVID-19 and the after effects, that's a big one for the church to consider and um globally and in new zealand i i think like you've mentioned some of it but i do want to like finish out with this question just uh generally thinking you have this platform now and this opportunity to actually say if you were speaking to the church in new zealand uh what would you want to challenge or exhort the church with regards to apologetics what would you want to affirm or praise or what would you want to inspire us towards um, just a general, a, a closing out statement with regards to apologetics. What would you want to say to the church with regards to that subject? Well, in the mosaic of important things in for Christian faith, it's important. But it's, you know, I'm not one of these people who wants to bang a drum and say it's all about apologetics because it's not. Sure. Uh, um, either. I, I think, and I don't claim to be an expert in everything. I'm just as, you know, I think the, you, know, you say talk to the New Zealand church. I, I actually strongly believe in New Zealand, the local church is critical. The local people of God, where they are. I think we're in, 
you know, I'm an optimistic pessimist, a pessimistic optimist. I, you, um, I think we're in for a tough few decades, maybe long centuries. You know, um, that can sound a bit um, defeatist. It's not. It's, you know, there's. I'm mean, a realistic idealist. You could say the, Is the Israelites were in Egypt for 400 years. <laughs> you know, um, imagine being there in the middle of that. I think there's going to be a, a lot of discouragement. Um, so you, you're drawn back to what is this all about? I, I have no interest in religion. You know, I'm a Christian because I believe it's true. You know, I believe the gathered people of God is important. But I think we're going to, you know, a lot of the institutions of the church in New Zealand are just tradition and culture. You know, uh, we're not in power anymore. Hallelujah. Thanks goodness for that, because we weren't that brilliant when we were. Amen. Uh, um, at times, at times, there is advantages of being yeah. in power. And good was done by many. Um, so let's get used to that. And let's let's see how do we, what is this context now? I mean, and that's why I go back to the first 300 years of the church. We're going to be misunderstood. We're going to be vilified. There's going to be people who just don't, simply don't understand us. You know, our, our views on sexuality, our views on family and marriage in particular, um, you know, um, but, yeah, and then, but, but don't be drawn personally. Don't be, you know, I'd say, don't be drawn to angry reaction. You know, let's just be confident in God, trust in God, keep on doing, being faithful. Uh, we're not drawn to success. We're drawn to be faithful. Uh, God will bring success in his own time. Yeah. And and after success is seen as human success, and it might not be success really anyway. Um, and so let's just be faithful. And in that faithfulness, knowing what we believe and why we believe it is important. Because as you said, you know, from that will flow uh, an ability to control feelings, which can be often misleading, an ability to see lies, and does translate into our behavior and our living. Uh, if if we connect it, yeah. If we make it twenty four seven about what we're all about, I don't know if that makes sense. But um, but also, I don't want to sound as though I want to pontificate the whole church. I, I don't claim to be an expert in, in, in everything, and uh, there's lots of good people doing lots of good things out there faithfully, and you know, we'll see what the spirit is going to do in this next few decades. But I think it's going to it might be quite different. Uh, well, thank you, Mark. I have been absolutely thrilled to have sat down with you. Very enriching conversation, very challenging conversation, very uh, hopefully one that causes people to think, because I think our discipleship needs to be one that is informed by this, this self-examination process. I think that's that's something that's been a bit of a, a call to uh, inherent in our conversation. Um, oh. I, I Forgive me, I... Uh, should have mentioned this earlier. Um, is there anything that you would like to plug at this stage? Um, is there anything you would like to plug at this point in the in the podcast? Well, I, 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 when when I plug your local church, wherever it is, mm. being gathered is important. If you're one of those people who's, oh well, I've got out of the habit of, of gathering, or you know, as, as you know, there are people who are cynical and say, well, it's just entertainment on Sunday. No, being gathered is important. It encourages each other. Mm. Yeah, so I would I would encourage, you know, there's these Christians now who say they believe but don't belong uh, because they've been hurt by church because mm. they've seen the superficiality of some of how church is done. I say get past that. You can contribute. Be part of the people of God where you are in your local church because mm. um, I do think that's important. Um, in terms of, so I'm plugging your local church, uh, whatever that is. Um, Second, you know, and be part of making it the church you wanted to be. Um, don't don't grumble, don't moan, don't undermine. Just be part of it and contribute your amazing gift in, which will be different to mine, you know, uh, in whatever way you can to the people of God. Um, secondly, um, you know, I'd plug Thinking Matters. They got their conferences going on in the next few months around New Zealand. Um, so, you know, if you found the apologetic side of things interesting um you know I, I take a look at that go to their website uh go to their conferences 
um, you, you'll find it uh, help, uh, helpful. Um, I'd encourage those of you uh, who in business, um, you know, to see it as as an important part of who you are as a Christian, um, and uh, be be you know be be Jesus where you are. Mm. Uh, you know, well worn phrase. And the last plug is you know, if you listen to this and you're in the business coast, you know, Tahi Electrical, my son-in-law's businesses. Yes. Uh, you know, <laughs> Tahi Electrical. Um, give them a call if you've got any electrical work or you want solar put in, in your, oh, in your house <laughs> <laughs> and they're based out of Hibiscus Coast is that right? That's right yes, yes. yes. <laughs> good to know um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, it's been a real pleasure, would you mind if as we close out I can pray for you Mark of course, of course. thank you so much Pray's always good <laughs> um, dear Lord Jesus we thank you again for the reminder to be salt and light to be the, the curative, to be the purative, to be the tasty in this world, Lord, to actually uh, be in the business of actually saying wherever we are, whatever we do, we shall carry the name of God. Um, and that Christians should not feel a sense of like there's a dichotomy or there's a listing of these are the pre-approved things that you can do to glorify God, but rather actually having an attitude of whatever we do, eating or drinking, uh, that we would glorify God in it, that worship would be less about a prescribed set of activities, but more a, a, uh, a way of doing life, a stance of living, a living sacrifice. And Lord, I thank you that the, the reminder of all these things has been our, our wonderful brother, Mark Powell, um, who has, has challenged us, has invited us to reconsider, has, has encouraged us to think through things epistemologically, has encouraged us to think about our why and our, our why not, maybe by extension as well, um, and has is, is encouraged us to actually see those bigger questions as being preeminent, fundamental to then actually detailing and discerning, well, what is the what then, the what we do and the how, Lord, um, because they are important. And I, I think just as he said, I so agree with them, you know, as Christians, we often do a lot of our lives without self-examination. Um, he was saying it more specifically to a particular point, but more widely, I think there's a lot of actually, we don't examine the reasons for why we do what we do. A lot of Christian needs and a lot of Christian subculture that maybe needs to be more biblically informed and more spirit informed and definitely both of those things in tandem and not one at the exclusion of the other. I thank you that in what has been said, all of these things have been advocated. And I thank you for his wisdom and I thank you for his vocational ministry, that you have him on these boards, you have him in these teaching roles, that you have him in these spaces, challenging and affirming and exhorting, such as um, a biblical practice and tradition throughout the centuries of those called to prophetic roles, to prophetic tasks, um, of those called to educational and rabbinic tasks, Lord. Um, I, I pray you would continue to equip him with wisdom, continue to uh, uh, give him testimonies to affirm his own faith, um, uh, the instances where actually he can say, God, you were good and you were great and you have clearly revealed your truth and done your work here. And I, I pray, Lord, that he would be able to actually then therefore uh, bring those things in tandem when he does minister both the, the rational and the intellectual and the, the aesthetic and the romantic, because both are of consequence within a holistic epistemology that Christian theism offers. And I thank you that he has articulated this again so well. Um, I pray a blessing on his, on his wife, on his family, on his beautiful grandchildren, Lord. I pray for rich intimacy and rich joy between that family and, and more of your goodness, and of more of taste and see that the Lord is good um, for good times ahead. Um, we aren't prosperity gospel advocates per se, Lord, but we do pray for blessing on this business as our son-in-law's business also, Lord. And we do pray that that would actually have a have your favor um, on the various levels of administration, of, of opportunity, of work and labor itself, of just that you would actually bring those things to pass as another, yet another instance of your goodness. And when we can testify and say, Lord is, the Lord is good. Look how he looks after us. Look how he provides for us. Jehovah Yida. Um, so I thank you, you, you've done these things in Mark's life. I thank you that everything he talks about is an overflow and again, a testimony to that providence. And we pray that he would go with your blessing tonight and further on to the work that you have called him to do for tomorrow. Um, 
for definitely um, the evil is sufficient thereof each day unto itself, Lord. And I, I thank you, Lord, again, for our conversation tonight. May it reach people, may it challenge people, may it bless people. In the name of Jesus, we pray that powerful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, friend. Thank you.